Back in 2009, a star in the galaxy NGC 6946 flared in brightness before dimming so much that it seemed to have disappeared entirely. Now, the explanation that astronomers came up with that could actually explain all the data and the observations that have been collected was that the star had run out of fuel. But then instead of going supernova, as would normally happen, where the outer layers of the star are thrown off and then just the core of the star collapses down into either a neutron star or a black hole, instead it's thought that this star skipped the supernova phase entirely and the entire thing collapsed down into a black hole. But this month, a research paper has been published by Beza and collaborators who observed the same patch of sky with the James Webb Space Telescope, JWST, and concluded that what's there now is probably not a black hole, and that's not what happened. Which is a big deal, because this object, dubbed N6946-BH1, if it had skipped supernova and collapsed straight down into a black hole, it would have solved a decade-old mystery in astrophysics known as the Red Supergiant Problem. So in this video, we're going to dive into, first, what the Red Supergiant Problem is, second, what Beza and collaborators have found in their new research study, and three, the other possible explanations for what happened to N6946-BH1. All right, so let's start with the Red Supergiant Problem. So our best theory for how stars evolve tells us that stars anywhere from around 8 to 25 times heavier than the sun will, at the end of their lives, swell up to become red supergiants, essentially to try and delay the inevitable when they finally run out of fuel. This is the type of star that Betelgeuse is, and to give you a sense of scale for red supergiants, if the sun was a tennis ball, then Betelgeuse would be the size of the London eye. They are really super giant. So inside a red supergiant, you've not got normal hydrogen fusion going on anymore that's powering normal stars. You've got fusion of heavier elements into ever heavier elements all the time until it's not hot enough or dense enough to kickstart like the next stage of fusion of the heavier elements together. And then at that point, the star will explode, throwing off its outer layers in a process known as a supernova, while the core will collapse down into either a neutron star or a black hole, just depending on how heavy the star originally was. Now, this type of of supernova is known as a type 2-p supernova and thanks to big astronomical surveys of the sky when a supernova goes off we have images available to look at what was there before what's known as the progenitor star to the supernova the problem is is that our theory is telling us one thing that stars between 8 to 25 times the mass of the sun should go through this evolutionary phase but we've only ever found progenitor stars of these type 2p supernovas up to 19 times the mass of the sun. So we have a mass gap between 19 and 25 times the mass of the sun where we're missing like red supergiant progenitors to supernovae. This is the red supergiant problem. And there's been many hypotheses raised over the years to try and explain this mass gap and this red supergiant problem. Either the star slowly sheds its outer layers and therefore stops being a red supergiant, which is why you don't see them before they go supernova. Or these heavier stars go through a stage in their evolution where they become shrouded in thick dust, which dims their brightness, making them harder to spot and associate to a progenitor of a supernova. Or that idea that we heard before that they skip supernova entirely and directly collapse into a black hole. So when N6946-BH1 just dimmed in brightness and seemed to have collapsed straight down into a black hole, there was a lot of excitement. We thought we'd maybe finally solve this red supergiant problem. The issue was that the data wasn't quite convincing enough. Like, yes, the star that seemed to be there before very, very quickly and drastically dimmed in brightness in visible wavelengths that we see with our eyes, but actually it stayed a fairly constant brightness in the infrared, especially the near-infrared wavelengths that were probed by the Hubble Space Telescope, for example. Now, that could still be the black hole scenario that's going on. That's why the idea was raised, because it could be that you've got material then swirling around the black hole that's then been formed, which uh, is accelerated to huge speeds and therefore it gets hot and it starts to glow in infrared wavelengths. But it could also be that the star has gone through some phase of evolution where it's thrown out a lot of dust and the dust has blocked the visible light, but not the infrared light, so we can still see the light of the star in the infrared. But the Hubble Space Telescope data that they had at the time couldn't tell those two scenarios apart. For that, you need to look at longer infrared wavelengths of light, so you need JWST. 
Which brings me to part two, what Beza and collaborators have found in their latest research with JWST. So they used both the NearCam and MIRI detectors on board JWST, which are sensitive to shorter, the near infrared, and also longer, the far infrared wavelengths of light, respectively. Now, the brighter an object is in those near infrared wavelengths that NearCam detects, then the hotter it is. Whereas cooler objects, like for example, dust grains, give out longer infrared wavelengths of light because they're much cooler. And so if you can detect something in MIRI, then you usually know there's a lot of dust there that is glowing. So let's start with the NearCam images first, detecting those shorter wavelengths of light. In this image, the yellow contour circle shows the outline of the progenitor star that was seen by the Hubble Space Telescope pre-2009. And inside that, you can then see that now JWST has detected three separate objects. But if we look at the MIRI image, which detects longer wavelengths given out by dust, all you can see is just one big glowing blob. So there's clearly a lot of dust shrouding these three objects that are seen in the near cam image. We can also look at the total amount of light detected at these different wavelength ranges. So the brightness in the MIRI images is shown by the purple dots here. The brightness in the near cam images is shown in the blue. But then you've also got data from the Hubble Space Telescope and Spitzer as well in the open gray squares. And then all of these have been compared to the total brightness of the star that was there before, the progenitor star that's shown by the red stars, and then also a model of what that progenitor star looked like by the red line there. And you can see, yeah, there's that huge drop in the optical and near infrared wavelengths, but the far infrared detected by MIRI shows just a slight brightening of what you'd expect compared to the progenitor star. So that brings us to point three. What are the possible explanations for these results? Well, Beza and collaborators considered two possible scenarios to explain what they found. Starting first with that failed supernova and collapse straight down into a black hole idea. Now, as we've heard, the optical, the near infrared data fits this scenario just fine, but it's this new far infrared data from MIRI that's difficult to explain. Like hypothetically speaking, yes, that amount of far infrared light could come from the fact that you have accretion of material onto this newly formed black hole. You know, if there's a lot of dust there, for example, the problem is the models that um, sort of simulate this whole process of collapse of a star straight down to a black hole are not sophisticated enough to be able to make any predictions that we can test the data against. However, we do know that that far infrared brightness would be expected to drop with time as the activity of the black hole decreased because there was less material there for it to accrete. So we should have seen some noticeable dimming by now in the 14 years since 2009 in the original dimming event, which is not what Beza and collaborators have found. So it's looking less and less likely that N6946-BH1 is actually a star that skips supernova and collapsed directly down into a black hole. Instead, Beza and collaborators say that the most likely explanation for their data would be if something happened to throw off huge amounts of dust. Something like the merger of two stars or a change in a binary system of two stars to become something known as a common envelope system where the atmosphere of a larger star like a red supergiant is shared with the star it's orbiting around and they share a common envelope. This scenario as well of the merger of two stars or two stars becoming like these common envelope stars is actually supported by the fact that progenitor flared in brightness first before dimming as well because you can imagine if the two stars were spiraling ever ever closer before either the change happened or they merged then yes you would expect this huge dramatic flare in the brightness of the stars before all of the heavier elements in the stars were also thrown out in the process as well in sort of a huge big sort of chaotic dust torus so like a donut shape which then caused the original dimming of the optical light. So the authors are pretty confident from the data they have that N6946-BH1 is not actually a directly collapsed black hole. Although more MIRI data would help here, so not images this time, but a spectrum of light instead. So you take the light from the object, you split it through a prism into its component colors or wavelengths, and you get a trace of how much light at each wavelength you receive. With that, you'd be able to tell what kind of dust you have, what the dust was made of, and then you'd be able to tell those two different scenarios apart, because you expect the dust to be different in the black hole collapse where you have accretion versus dust that's been thrown out in some merger or common envelope events. But until we have that data, 
All we know for now is that the red supergiant problem rather frustratingly remains unsolved. I just started talking to myself and I wasn't recording. <laughs> I think I would know how to do this by this point. Solved a decades long astrophysics problem known as the red supergiant problem. I do love the red supergiant problem because it's like, it's not just a problem, it's a supergiant problem. <laughs> supergiant, supergiant, the supergianty. Bit of a premature naming in the N6946-BH1. BH stands for black hole. Don't name things till you know what it is, people. <sighs> Something like a merger of two stars or a change in a binary system of two stars where they become something known as a common envelope. It's a common envelope. It's such a weird phrase to say, common envelope. I feel like you really do have to enunciate it. So I end up feeling like I sound like Rowan Atkinson, just like common envelope. I don't know what it is. That's just how I hear it in my head. <laughs>